Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was after uh, Haiti earthquake last year we started thinking about things and uh, have really started the development March last year and got to prototype stage by about July after some very crazy 80 hour weeks. Um, and yeah, it's just uh, plugging along really nicely. And, and I'll let you talk, tell them all about it. Absolutely. That. <laughs> let me uh, get myself organised here. Uh, we're using Android phones, but the interesting thing is Windows Mobile will probably actually be easier for us to get it to work on with the meshing without needing root access than Android. Um, just as one of these strange things. So I'm quite happy to talk to, uh, to Microsoft about this as well. We want it on every phone, really. Um, before I get started into the, uh, the full-on talk, um, my first, if you like, uh, mobile development is uh, a genuine shoe phone. Um, I like Get Smart. So uh, if anyone wants to have a, a look at some shoe phones after, they're here. And I'll just get the, uh, the laptop sorted out. Everyone enjoying conference so far? Yeah? Okay, let's get this happening. Do, 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 da, 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 da. Hello, computer. Oh, ooh, that's quaint of it to do that for me. Okay. So, as mentioned, talking about the uh, the several project. So. Um, Ads for other talks. Um, this morning I gave a talk talking about some of the, the back stories. If you want to kind of know where we've come from and kind of my crazy approach to, uh, to various things, uh, you can grab the, the video online for that. Um, Thursday uh, morning I'll be doing a, kind of the main talk about the project. Um, and we'll go into some more of the, the big picture, but I'll do a, a quick run through today. And um, <laughs> assuming I can get all of the crazy stuff organised, I've been booking um, airspace with Brisbane Airport and trying to get helium and regulators and uh, most difficult of all getting permission from QUT to, uh, to have a balloon on a string. Um, granted a 100 metre long string in a, uh, a one cubic metre balloon, but nonetheless. Um, we'll actually do a demonstration of this technology um, as a, you know, a mock-up of uh, getting mobile coverage back into a, uh, a disaster area. Um, so serval is all about mesh networking. Um, this thing is quite long enough. Uh, that's right. Um, so what we're... Um, we're trying to do is whether it's disaster or whether it's um, rural, remote, um, any of these kind of situations, uh, we want to be able to get telecommunications in and have it uh, be resilient in the face of all manner of things. Um, you know, whether that is um, you know, disaster, it could simply be you know, terrible geography, you go into the highlands of Papua New Guinea or into uh, I think even uh, East Timor there's certainly uh, issues with uh, tall vegetation and all of these sorts of things that can make mobile coverage uh, difficult to maintain. So we thought, okay, let's come up with something that um, you know, can work anywhere. And uh, that actually it, it created, made some very simple uh, assumptions that we could make. So um, this is our assumption of logistic convenience um, and existing infrastructure. So it basically, if it could work on the far side of the moon, then it would meet all of our other needs. Um, in terms of user skills and user education, um, someone's long dead grandmother um, is kind of the... Uh, you know, the learning curve that we're pitching at. So it, it simply had to work like a normal telephone. So normal phone numbers and without anyone having to really kind of mess about and choose whether they're on mesh or on the public network or any of these things. And finally, we had to use existing phone numbers. Uh, in a disaster environment in particular, um, say if, you know, I mean, if someone actually just gave you a phone and you went, excellent, I've got a, a mobile phone and coverage again in a disaster zone. But if you didn't have your own phone number and the people that you cared about, your family, your friends, um, whoever, didn't have their existing phone numbers, it actually would not be very useful to you. Um, whereas if everyone kept their same number and you go, excellent, I can, you know, I can ring my family, they're alive, they're safe, 
fantastic. Um, the emotional release of that is actually very significant. And it enables people... If you know that your family is safe and you can be in touch with them if they need you, um, you can then go on and help other people. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we're looking to enable, as well as you know, infill with damaged infrastructure, like here around Brisbane with the flooding, where a number of cell towers um, got wet feet and were, were off for a while. And in actual fact, um, who's having trouble with their mobile phone coverage even now on conference? A few people? Um, yeah. It's normal, is it? it? Like, it's the normal level of badness? Wow, OK. Well, our technology has use in peacetime as well then. <laughs> um, so we'll just kind of flip through. So then in thinking about those assumptions, you know, we decided it had to be an ad hoc mesh. It had to be wireless. Um, I mean, they're kind of obvious things. I mean, if you tried to do it any other way, it would be very, very bizarre. Um, as much fun as it would be to have bits of string laying around the place. Um, but also the self-claiming of phone numbers. Again, in a disaster zone, if, you, if your phone goes flat or squished or whatever and you get someone else's phone, um, it's really important that you can actually claim your phone number again. You can't wait for the phone company to be back up and running because the whole point is it's a disaster and they're not working. Um, and let alone, you know, that's the last thing they want to do is fending off, you know, half a million people trying to get their phone numbers back and prove that, you know, you know please divert all my phone calls to this SIM card that I've got no idea what number it really is. So we put a, a system into self-claim phone numbers very easily. So you go, okay, excellent, fantastic, all good. Um, oh, authentication. How do we authenticate this self-claiming of numbers so that it's actually vaguely sane? So we actually we decided on a very, very simple solution. Simply let people claim their phone number, um, but then get a voice print, a bit like voicemail. You know, you ring someone's voicemail and you know you're leaving voicemail for the right person because you can hear the person talking. It's much easier than doing some kind of you know, whacked out um, high-tech digital solution. It's much easier to let people's wetware in their brain work out whether they're talking to the right person or not. So. It's just very, very simple, and it lets us do this incredibly powerful thing of actually letting people grab their own phone number immediately. And you could actually have, I mean, if only one of us in this room had a phone um, and there was a, a disaster here with our system, we could actually put all of our phone numbers into the phone. So if anyone rung any of those numbers, it would actually ring that one phone. And it might be that you, know, you might move to somewhere else. There might be a pay phone that's available. Again, you could actually then basically make your phone number follow you to where you're going. So it's really designed about empowering communication in any circumstance. So in terms of uh, the calling and security model, um, we've decided to use um, public-private, um, sorry, a mental blank happening here, um, asymmetric um, PKI uh, cryptography. So we're using elliptic curve because it's got really nice short keys and is believed to be much more secure than RSA for any given bit length because there's no shortcuts for solving the elliptic curve problem at the moment. So 160-bit key gets us pretty good security. So the private key you use to sign any transaction that the phone is authorising, and then the public key is what people use to actually contact you. So it's a, it's a very simple, elegant solution, and you just you roll your own uh, private key. So there's no central authority for that PKI. Sure, we can layer that on top and sort of say that, you know, I vouch that your number is your number and you vouch that mine is mine and have a whole reputation system built around that. But that's a layer on top. So the subscriber ID is this um, public key. And then the phone numbers are separate from that so that you can move phone numbers around between subscriber IDs in a, uh, a very portable kind of way. And when a phone call happens on the mesh, uh, the phone starts by actually broadcasting, very much like ARP, in fact, um, except instead of putting out an IP address and getting an Ethernet address back, you put out a, um, a direct dial-in number and you get given a SIP address back. And that might be for local on the mesh or that might be a SIP address that actually goes to a, a PSTN gateway of some kind. And um, if I actually turn these on now, because they take a little while to boot, um, we can actually do a, a demo of that in a few minutes. And uh, people are welcome to have a... Uh, a play with these after as well. Okay, and uh, of course, once you've done the, the mapping from direct dial-in number um, through SID to get the uh, the SIP address, you can actually cache the SID for future reference. So it's, um, you know, we can simplify the, the call in future. And in particular, the verification stage where we use that voice signature, you can actually skip. So the first time you call someone who's claimed their own phone number, 
um, you'll basically get a message played to you by your phone saying, you know, we found someone who's claimed that number on the network, but we can't guarantee that it's that person. Here, listen to them say their name, and if you think that you want to be connected, you know, press hash. So it's a very simple solution for, you know, for a best effort communications network, we have best effort authentication in the situation. Uh, but we can, as I say, bypass that for uh, subsequent calls. So here's how our software stack looks on the phone. So SIPDroid is actually providing the, uh, the SIP client. Um, we actually had to do a bit of hacking with SIPDroid to make it behave. It was never designed um, to expect there to be a, um, a VoIP server on the phone itself. So, you know, we thought, okay, fine, you know, we've got everything on there, uh, no SIM card in the phone, put in 127.0.0.1 as the server address, and it, it happily takes that. Um, and then it told us, oh, you don't have a data connection. Um, I can't connect to the server. And it's like, nah. Um, so we had to, to hunt around and find where it was, you know, looking for uh, the data connection, all of that kind of thing, and uh, adjust a few lines of code. And then we got all that working, and then it wouldn't use any codecs. And we're like, oh, what's going on now? And it turns out what it does is it finds out what speed your data connection is and filters the connections based on that. But of course, you know, it wasn't counting on the loopback interface actually being available. So um, it was a lot of effort to find the six lines of code that we actually needed to, uh, to change in there. We, we need to get around to putting that patch back out, actually. Uh, so that then feeds into an asterisk server, which is using the, uh, the village telco um, dialing model and uh, configuration. So uh, David Rowe is actually giving a talk on Village Telco on Thursday, um, immediately after, but in a different room to where I'll be presenting more on this project. So if you want to find out the ins and outs of the Village Telco project, actually, I think they're talking more about uh, the deployment of it, but it, it's all really good stuff. So uh, then we've got our special source, which is DNA, which is our distributed numbering architecture, which is what does this number mapping with the ARP style and the caching and all of that kind of thing. So uh, for speed, we've made a, uh, a plug-in for Apache, uh, so that basically there's an Apache function, so you can do sDNA lookup and give it a phone number and get a SIP address straight back. So um, we can dial and connect uh, in about a second, which is actually, if you think actually about how long it takes a mobile phone network to connect your call through these days, um, it's kind of silently extended over the years, and it's now, it's not uncommon for it actually to be five to 10 seconds before a phone starts ringing on a mobile network. So, um, back to, uh, to DNA, so below the, uh, the DNA plugin we have the DNA daemon which actually sits there listening to the socket on the network uh, and puts the requests out and, and handles all of that process um, and maintains a, a little database uh, very similar to the HLR database that exists on a, a GSM network insofar as it maintains the subscriber records. So with these phones they've got plenty of storage so they can always fit their own record but if you're uh, using a, a mesh potato or another device that has only limited capacity and you try and get 400 people to register their number onto the device and it's got 16 megabytes of flash for everything, including the operating system, it may be that your subscriber record needs to get stored on an adjacent node on the network. So we have support for that. Uh, then we're using the Batman uh, mesh routing algorithm below that uh, to do the actual meshing. And uh, we've modified Android Wi-Fi Tether to basically stop and start our demons and um, it was really nice to be able to make use of the, uh, the Wi-Fi Tether application because it, it turns out getting Android phones into an ad hoc mesh, um, A, is unsupported and B, is a blazing mess of um, different chipsets and different kernel modules and yeah, it, it's just disgusting. Um, and it seems that no matter who complains to Google about this, there's actually no action on them actually providing an API for ad hoc mesh networking. Even, I mean, Froyo claims to have um, you know, soft hotspot mode and all of these lovely advances in uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi, but it does not have actual ad hoc Wi-Fi, um, which we're a bit cheesed about. And um, I posted on the, the Android platform mailing list about this issue, and you know, there's Android developers on the list and basically didn't even get a reply to say, you know, that sounds lovely or no, we're not going to do it. Um, so I think everyone's actually looking for uh, Wi-Fi ad hoc on Android is feeling a little bit disappointed at the moment. So... Uh, by all means, complain as loudly as you can to as many people at Google and Android as you can. Um, and as I say, we're, we're looking at other platforms where we can support that. And Windows Phone actually is one. Uh, I certainly know for Windows Phone 6, it's pretty easy to do um, ad hoc mesh. And is, what about Windows Phone 7? Do you know if ad hoc mesh is... Um... Probably don't give you an access lower level, just at the moment. Okay, um, yep, so... Okay, yep, so um, talking with... Okay, so no at this stage in Windows Phone 7, but um, 
yeah, we'll have that discussion. And I think um, Nokia as well, uh, with their Linux platform, it's actually much, much easier to, uh, to do this as well. So uh, it's a little bit disappointing because Android is actually really nice in a, a variety of other ways for what we're doing. But we want to support every mobile platform in any case. And then, of course, below that, you've got all the fun of uh, your uh, Wi-Fi interfaces. But also, uh, we can do it over um, wired Ethernet. So the mesh potato devices have an Ethernet port as well as Wi-Fi. So if you do have backhaul infrastructure, we can tie into that in a, uh, a nice kind of way. So this is you know, one application of what we can actually do with this. So the, uh, the green links, of course, are cellular links. So we've got a, a phone down there by the tower that has a, a direct connection. And then on the other side of the hill, we've got a, a phone tower. And um, I should have drawn some water in around the feet of that other phone tower to uh, you know, explain why it might not be working. Um, but in any case, so there's a couple of phones on the ground that were in the reception of that cell tower that are no longer. So if we literally put one of our phones with our software um, and, and physically tie it to a balloon and float it up where it can see the other tower and see those phones, um, it will gateway traffic to the, uh, the global phone network and you can dial internationally from those phones on the mesh. Um, and that's what we're going to do Thursday lunchtime. Um, and I, I can demonstrate it here without a balloon as well, um, which we'll do. So thinking more about that, um, that scenario, so if we have the, uh, the grey cell as a dead cell, even without any balloons at all, we can kind of, you know, phones that are near the edge, we can you know, seep coverage in around the edges in a completely automatic way. Um, one of the interesting things, mesh networking tends to be power hungry, but um, take your, uh, your sm any modern smartphone and take it out of phone coverage and see just how fast searching for a 3G signal depletes the battery. It turns out it's faster than using the mesh. Um, we discovered this when we did our field trial at Arcarula last July. We did all our testing around where there was a, a signal and you know, we were getting hours and hours and hours out of you know, G1s, particularly if you put a, a big battery on them. And we got up to Arcarula and we were getting like an hour out of the batteries. And I'm like, no, what's gone wrong? What's eating all the power? And then it, it dawned on me afterwards that it was you know, these phones yelling at four watts um, continuously switching bands at high bit rates um, and listening really, really hard with their um, input amplifiers turned up um, to try and find the phone network. So we can actually, um, with this now, we can actually extend the battery life of phones in the dead cell and provide them with coverage and they can cooperatively look for the mobile phone signal because um, you don't need a hundred phones or a thousand phones in a cell looking for the um, the signal continuously, they can actually you know, share that around and it might be that you know, on a 2% a duty cycle the phones actually look for signal and then they can report to neighbouring phones, you know, oh yes, I've got signal, you might like to look on you know, 1873 megahertz uplink or you know, whatever the, the details are. So if we add the balloon in, of course we can make the situation better. So you know, from a, a good altitude you can get surprisingly long distance, um, it's certainly with mobile coverage but even Wi-Fi. So the Village Telco guys, just using um, their mesh potatoes, which is standard 100 milliwatt um, devices with no directional antenna, they would easily get 2.1 kilometres. Um, and that was actually just between two jetties in uh, metropolitan South Australia. So there's still actually background interference um, limiting that. But you can probably do 6 to 10 kilometres from that range. And you know, one of the things, of course, is your Fresnel zones are nice and clear, certainly around the phone at the balloon. Um, but also when you're actually on the ground, if your signal is going mostly up, of course your Fresnel zone is oriented up and you have a, a, a much better situation. So you know, that can help substantially. And then hopefully we can tie in all of the phones in the mesh, reduce the hop count and make life happy. Um, if now you're in a, a real hardcore disaster zone where everything has gone out, again, you know, say if we, we already had that balloon there and the rest of the network went out, so that cell's getting good internal coverage and people can call each other internally as well with this, of course, because the mesh can do the, the number resolution without reference to the internet, which is a, a key point. And, you know, we can probably get a few neighbouring phones from other cells to participate, but we're not going to get complete coverage. And then, you know, someone might, nice might come along, maybe the Red Cross, and put a, a big and satellite terminal in or something like that. And uh, again, we can provide a, a gateway to the public switch telephone network. So a mesh potato with a big and terminal uh, will do that job very nicely and for a less than $2,000 worth of equipment. It's surprisingly cheap. And uh, then if we uh, get a few more party balloons up there or you know, um, people with masks or anything that we can use to get the altitude, we can then actually start you know, seriously re-establishing mobile communications across a large area. 
And I mean, when you look at it, literally all that we're using there is five balloons, one satellite terminal, and a lot of mobile phones that are already in the area. And that community can communicate. And I think the effects that that can have for uh, maintaining law and order in disaster zones, I think you look at Haiti and the, uh, you know, the social breakdown that happened was in many ways um, exacerbated by the loss of communication. So the police couldn't self-organise. People on the ground couldn't self-organise to defend. I mean, you think about the horrific things, you know, whether it's Haiti or whether it's places in Africa or anywhere where you get rape, uh, rape gangs going around because they know that you know, law and order really isn't happening. If those gangs knew that people in the area could phone people around them and within a minute that there'd be a whole pile of other people from that community there, I reckon those rape gangs would be thinking twice about doing what they do. And you, know, you look at militias attacking villages and people, and again, the same thing. We can really mobilise people to defend themselves, which is fantastic. And we can also look at you know, getting people... You know, if you've got subsistence farmers, if they can find out what the market price is and someone comes along and offers them 10% of market price and they can just ring instead of walking for two days to get there, suddenly it's much more feasible than you know, hop on the phone for a, a free or very, very cheap call and go, oh, so, you know, so what are you going to pay me for, uh, you know, for corn or coconuts or chickens or um, mobile phones or whatever the commodity is that they're producing there? And they go, oh, okay, so that's the price. Oh, this guy's offering me that. And he can go back to the, the person there and say, oh, okay, you've got transport costs and you, know, you need to make a profit too, but you know, I want 50% of market value. So those subsistence farmers can get you know, several times the income that they might have got previously and really help to start bootstrapping themselves out of entrenched poverty. And I will be tickled pink if I can look back in 10 or 20 years' time and say that I've played a, a key role in enabling people to escape entrenched poverty and you know, improving law and order and safety in places around the world. Um, but I'm ranting slightly. Um, now that we've probably covered this a little bit already where we're talking about the, um, you know, the process of number resolution. So we've got you know, one phone up here is sort of thinking, you know, where can I find Paul Gardner Stephen's mobile phone? And my phone's looking over here on the mesh and says, OK, that's me, here's my SIP address. And um, we just we broadcast that over the mesh uh, using Batman. Or alternatively, the, um, the gateway might actually say, you know, I can connect you to that phone number on the public switch phone network, and here's an address for that. And ideally, the phone that's trying to, uh, to ring me will go, oh, OK, yep, he's available on the mesh. I'll try that first, because that's free and cheapest. And we're incorporating um, cost models into the protocol so that when you make a call, you can choose based on price and link quality and a whole pile of other uh, interesting things. Demo time. Um, this was actually uh, a week or two ago. We went down underground in a cave and proved that we could make phone calls 90 metres underground, um, which was uh, very fun in and of itself. So let me... Um, Who'd like to get rung by a, uh, a mesh phone? Who'd like to ring someone on a mesh phone? Okay, excellent. So this is the phone that has a SIM card in it. So if someone just wants to hold that and pretend they're just using it as their phone. Um, and uh, hang on, I've given you the wrong phone. That is the phone that doesn't have a SIM in it. This is the one that does. Um, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, and you're quite welcome to come up and look. It's, you know, there's physically no SIM in it, and it's in aeroplane mode as well um, to save power, in fact, to not search for a phone network. Um, so, at the moment, that phone isn't running the mesh. So, if I try and ring the number, it won't connect because there's no gateway. So, um, do you want your phone number known to all the world? Excellent. Yep. Yep. Five, six, four. What a, a number with lots of fours in it. And I may need to get that out of you again because this phone tends to forget things. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Okay, let's try that again. Four, one, four. Yep. Four, six, five, six, four. Okay. So they're prototypes and I forgot to start an important thing. So it's trying to, to dial and it gives up after a while because it can't find the number on the mesh. So now on that phone, um, if you touch the little several bat phone icon, that should be sort of top right-ish below the search doodad. Excellent. Now touch the green thing in the middle. Still very technical. 
and it should say it's running. Like you'll be able to tell you when it is because. Yep. Okay, and it's starting. It's running now because my phone is now telling me there's one other phone on the mesh reachable. So now if I go in there again and I try and ring that number, um, assuming correct phase of moon and everyone's wearing the right coloured underpants, um, the call should go through. Dialing, dialing, dialing. Of course, it depends on the, the phone network here actually carrying the, uh, the data through. Oh, it thinks it's dialing. Your phone should be ringing in a minute. Whoop, saying no data. Let me just hang it up and try again. Uh, a MaySim, which I think are using Optus. It was just, the, it was just the, the cheapest, nastiest SIM that I could get for data. Okay, I'm just going to, to dial it again. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and I think we're having a. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We might be being uh, thwarted. Okay. Let me. Um, we'll try once more, and then we'll uh, we'll officially give up. Um, and we can do the demonstration outside where we're uh, not effectively in a Faraday cage. This is why we need to put the balloon up on Thursday. Uh, yeah, we're going to have a balloon on about a 100 metre tether. Uh, turns out it's easier to get air traffic control approval than it is to get a university to approve you to put a balloon on their oval. That's just <laughs> phenomenal. So that would go into the most Yes, it will. And it turns out that um, one of the, uh, the ambulance volunteers is actually a, a virgin pilot who will be flying back in when the notice to airmen will actually be in effect. So he's promised to keep us a copy. Oh, cool. <laughs> so... Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think we're we're officially going to give up on the basis that our gateway has a, a lack of signal, but um, hopefully you get the idea. Um, so in terms of things that we're looking to do down the track, um, that lovely picture with a satellite uplink. Um, who's ever watched how much traffic SIP generates? Yep. Like, I think my punt there at about a kilobyte a minute is probably a, a moderately conservative. Um, punt. Um, a nice satellite terminal will cost you about $10 a megabyte. So one phone is going to cost you about 14 bucks a day just to be available via SIP. So this clearly doesn't work. So our mesh um, distributed numbering resolution protocol, we're making what we're calling air clutch, which basically terminates on either side of the satellite link. So that the only traffic that you get is actually notification of new phones coming into the area, about 100 bytes uh, for each phone that comes into the area. And then it's actually absolutely zero traffic while the phone is actually in the network there. So that you can actually scale it up. I mean, you end up needing a lot of satellite terminals just to get a lot of phones associated with SIP and contention and a whole pile of muck. And uh, we've run out of time. But people can talk to me. Yep. And people can uh, talk to me about other things that we're looking to do down the track as well. Thank you. Got one actually. Can I ask one? Am I allowed that? Yeah. Um, the balloons. Yes. Um, how long do they stay up, and how do the phones fare up in that, right up in the sky like that, with the sun beating down on them, or in the weather? And all that For the, the kind of time frame that you're talking about in a disaster response, um, all of them are going to be fine. But really, we're using balloons as an illustration. Um, it could simply be that you know you find the nearest tall building or hill or anything that's going to give you that altitude. And in fact, if you've got enough people in the cell anyway, then you're just going to have the, the join the dots connection in any case. But putting a balloon up enables you to get massive coverage very quickly and with a, a better reliability than you'll get with people on the ground. Um, a helium balloon should probably stay up for something like a fortnight if it's a, a decent balloon, um, you know, given that it will only be holding you know, a few hundred grams of phone. You'd actually need to pull it down and up again periodically to actually recharge the phone would be the, the main issue. Uh, or you could put some solar panels on, or but then it's more weight and you need a bigger balloon. But I mean, the key thing is that I guess you know basically you know a pile of, of party balloons 
and anyone's phone will actually provide coverage. It's massively empowering for the actual communities, and that's what we're trying to do. Yep. What's the deployment model for the software? How, how do you get all this software on the people's phone in advance? Like okay, yep. So, Okay, so the question is how are we going to get the, um, the software onto everyone's phones ahead of a disaster as compared to two days after a disaster? Um, and we would love to partner with mobile phone manufacturers. Um, certainly the first manufacturer to partner with us is going to have a massive competitive advantage by being able to offer a free calling service and a resilient calling service in the face of adversity. Um, I think they are fantastic advantages. Uh, for any carrier, uh, not, uh, sorry, for any handset manufacturer. And we're already talking with uh, one manufacturer and trying to talk with as many others as we can. And in particular, we'd like to talk to the, uh, you know, the handset operating system um, vendors. So you've know, got Microsoft and Android and um, Apple, if they'll let us, um, if they'll you know, bend down low enough to talk to us. Um, and, you know, and, and anyone else. We want it on every phone. And of course, it'll be in app stores and all of that kind of thing as well, if we can wangle it. Yes? Okay, to port your number. Yep. So what the key is here is that you can grab your number for use on the mesh. So anyone on the mesh will be able to call you on the mesh. Anyone who's off the mesh um, if we can get the carriers to play nicely, like in a disaster they may actually play nicely, then fantastic. But if not, what we'd actually do, and, you know, and public um, agencies would be advertising dial-in numbers to the mesh that would then prompt you for the number you want to call. So it's a, we figured that we couldn't depend on carriers, partly because they might actually be blown to bits by the disaster as well, and partly because um, there's not that much um, incentive for carriers to play nicely with this technology because it has the potential to be very disruptive to their business models. Um, that's not to say that it will actually destroy their business models, but a, a bit like the shift to, uh, to non-DRM protected music. It's an uncomfortable thought for carriers to entertain a move into this situation. But at some point, someone will do the technology. Hopefully it'll be us, but someone will do it and the carriers will have to adjust to the new world. Anybody else? Yes? Okay, so phone to phone range we're talking about? Uh, f range between phones we're talking about here, sure. That's right, so we're, us we're using the Wi Fi radio in the phones at the moment. Um, we actually have uh, plans to, uh, to use more than that. Um, there's some skullduggery that we'd like to do with the baseband processor on the phones that actually doesn't require any spectrum. Um, allocations or anything to be made and fits entirely within the legal frameworks of many countries. Um, that would give us a, a potentially a, a four watt transmitter, but in reality uh, limited to one watt and at lower bit rates that would massively improve the link budget. So that should be able to get kilometres um, type range in a, an urban area. Um, as it is with Wi-Fi, we can get a, you know, you can get a couple of hundred metres line of sight between phones, but the really interesting thing is in a disaster, the whole point is no one's microwave ovens are working anyway. Um, so the, the noise floor for Wi-Fi actually drops right down. So we found up at Arcarula when we were doing the field trial uh, that, you know, three, four, five hundred metres was, you know, happening without any real issues at all. Um, and that's without having the elevation. I mean, if we can get the, the clear Fresnel zones, then that's um, I can't, six or ten dB. I, I'm not really a, a radio guy, um, but I think it's something like that, which basically doubles your range uh, that you can expect as well. Sure. Okay, yep, so, yep. Okay, so the question is about security of basically someone getting someone else's voice signature and presenting that to, uh, to you know, attract calls to them that are intended for the other person. Absolutely, it's an issue, um, but I think in a disaster, I'd rather run that risk than not be able to call anyone. Um, but in a, uh, a more civilised setting where we can make use of internet and peacetime to get ready ahead of time, um, you know, I envisage things like, you know, having the, the post office, so you kind of rock up with your phone to the post office and, you know, you present some power bills and, 
um, phone bill to show that you actually own the phone number, and then the post office signs a certificate that goes onto your phone that says that basically, you know, the post office believes that you really are the owner of that number, and that PKI verification will go through to anyone calling you, and they'll say, oh, look, you know, they've been approved by the post office. Um, we can't trust carriers to do it because, again, there's no incentive for them to actually support us doing that. In fact, there are disincentives uh, for them to be involved in that process. But the post office doesn't get as many people through its doors as they used to, so I reckon when we get a little bit further along that the post office will be a, a great place to, uh, to explore. <laughs>